Welcome, everyone, to the Cardano Effect Podcast, Episode 74. The purpose of this podcast is to take high-level developer information and projects that are occurring within the Cardano space and break them down into bite-sized, consumable pieces of information for everyday use. I'm your host, Philippe, and let's get this podcast started. Rick and myself are the hosts of the Cardano Effect, and we have a lot of guests, and we also have a very special guest who's joining us today. Rick will be announcing this guest very shortly. So I want to thank everyone for tuning into the Cardano Effect. And remember, if you're not subscribed, please consider hitting the subscribe button. We have a very important podcast to get out to you today. So we hope that you enjoy. I like to remind everyone that none of what we say on this podcast is financial advice. Remember, you are your best financial advisor. And if you don't think you are, you need to find someone who's qualified to do so. So without further ado, Rick, how are you doing this morning? What's going on? What's happening? Philippe, I'm doing great. Thanks. I appreciate you asking. And I would like to give a shout out to the Cardano Foundation for sponsoring this podcast. We had 15 great months with IOHK as a sponsor, and we very much appreciate everything they, that they've done for us. And we now have the Cardano Foundation sponsoring the podcast. Thank you very much, Cardano Foundation. I would also like to remind viewers who are new to this podcast, the podcast is available on all audio streaming platforms. So if you're working out or driving in your car, you can... Uh, just play it over your iPod, any type of streaming device that you have. We're available on all of them. And I would like to get on to our special guest. Mr. Jonathan Dunsmore is with us today. He works in both law and blockchain. He's from Dunsmore, uh, Dun Dunsmore Law is his firm name. Jonathan, how are you doing today? Tell us a little bit about your firm. Uh, where are you calling in from? How's it going? Uh, I'm wonderful, guys. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm currently in South Carolina, uh, but I'm based in Buffalo, New York. So uh, the firm practices in the area of corporate and securities law, uh, but given the rise of blockchain, we had a bunch of clients that uh, started looking into ICOs as fundraising mechanisms, and we've kind of expanded from there to keep people out of trouble and advance the industry. So Jonathan, we hear about this word security a lot in blockchain. It's a buzzword. Can you describe in your attorney view, what is a security? There's a lot of debate as to what is a security, what isn't a security, isn't a security. What what does this word mean? What does this word mean in the t context of blockchain? In the context of blockchain, the holy grail of this stuff is the Howey test. Everybody knows that. Everybody still has to use it. It's from like 1943, but unfortunately, it is what we have. Um, and so that's a four-part test. Uh, it's the investment of money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit uh, through the efforts or effects of uh, a third party or promoter. And so you need all four to qualify as a security. Um, and once you qualify as a security, uh, you get to deal with the wonderful and lovely uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And this so, is important for us to know in blockchain because you, you have, there, there's not a lot of experience out there in the world in dealing with law and blockchain. This is like new front to new, new territory. <laughs> Do you have some examples, like some real world examples of what you've been working on that you could tell us about? Uh, yeah, we, we've handled everything from initial coin offerings that have gone awry uh, to uh, exchange listings that uh, had some jurisdictional issues um, to simple regulatory issues from different states. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really dependent on what kind of pops up. Uh, you know, back in 2016, it was the wild west of crypto and everybody was doing ICOs and raising all these monies. And uh, it was just chaos, utter chaos. Uh, as we've progressed, we've started realizing that the SEC is cracking down on this stuff. The CFTC is taking a super aggressive approach and sending out subpoenas to everyone and their mother um, regarding any what they believe is uh, a derivative of Bitcoin. So any blockchain uh, that is not Bitcoin, the uh, the CFTC believes is in their purview, meaning within their jurisdiction. And so if you're dealing with anything uh, involving that, uh, that anything outside of uh, Bitcoin, you're probably going to at least hit the CFTC's uh, whiteboard, uh, and then they will determine whether they consider you a quote-unquote threat and send you a subpoena and, and ask a bunch of questions about what you're doing. So it really kind of depends on what's going on and what you're building on, uh, what level of government you hit. Wow. That's scary. 
That's scary for, I mean, a lot of companies that are probably getting that letter. It's, yeah, it's not meant to be scary. Uh, you know, the federal government still does work for you uh, as much as, you know, we are Americans and, and paying taxes and all those kind of good things. But uh, it's, it's still about education for those guys. Uh, they don't understand a lot of it. They still uh, either call me or call other attorneys and say, hey, what, what is this? <laughs> we don't understand this. Um, and that's kind of the biggest component for most of the securities attorneys and, and blockchain attorneys in this space is the educational component for the regulators, um, both state and, and uh, federal, because what we saw with the ICO boom was uh, states believing that all of this stuff was bad. And Kyle, <laughs> we're going to you know point to you. Uh, we had an incident in North Carolina where Kyle was uh, using a mechanism that would not have been appropriate under federal and state law um, to raise funds for his Adoja project. We had a great relationship with uh, the state of North Carolina once they called Kyle and Kyle picked up and, <laughs> and talked to him. Uh, you know, wasn't shy, wasn't bashful. But we got involved and and we helped uh, you know mitigate those. Um, th that situation. Um, what what was really hurtful, though, is the state of North Carolina had an opportunity to expand on their own crowdfunding laws that were on the books, um, and they didn't. Uh, you know, they needed to change or add an exemption for digital securities to allow for what would have been legal ICOs back in what was that 2018, Kyle? Um, and and they didn't uh, take that opportunity. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it was April of 18, if I recall correctly. We had a joint press release. The regulators were cool, but I guess it got shot down from the very, very top. Yeah, um, the, yeah. the tr treasurer didn't want to didn't want to sign off on it, guys. So that's why the educational component uh, for me has been uh, the forefront. Um, I've literally gone around the world trying to speak on this stuff, trying to educate, uh, you know, like I said, different regulatory bodies, different state governments, because had Kyle been able to uh, you know, work with the state of North Carolina to get that up and running, that would have been a $2 million ICO, a legal ICO in, in 2018. Um, that would have been non-accredited investors. So anybody could invest. It, uh, invest. Uh, it would have been limited to North Carolina, but there was an exception where if you created an LLC in North Carolina, you could invest. <laughs> so it would have opened up uh, this entire world. Uh, um, I, th I think what you were really hitting on, John, was um... – what we almost had with the state and what it would have done for Bitcoin and the industry in general. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was an awesome opportunity because, like I said, it would have allowed for unaccredited investors to participate in what was effectively a, a DSO or a digital securities offering um, at the crowdfunding level. Uh, and the treasurer wouldn't sign off on it. There was an exemption within North Carolina crowdfunding laws that allowed for her to change uh, different parameters within that law. And we needed them to alter currency uh, because currency was the issue at that point. Um, we needed it to be as well as digital currency or other forms of payment uh, to allow for Bitcoin or Ethereum to be paid. And nope. Uh, wouldn't that have been a great potential for uh, the legislators as well, economically? I, I can tell you that both the uh, attorney and the investigator on Kyle's case were uh, integral in that legislation, and they were exceptionally uh, disappointed that yeah. uh, it did not come to fruition. And so they have both moved on uh, for a number of reasons. That may not be the only reason, but uh, that was that was very disappointing for all sides. Um, and, and that's rare <laughs> that the state uh. comes with you and says, wow, that, that was a loss uh, for both of us. Because uh, you know, Kyle, and if you don't mind me sharing, Kyle didn't have any fines or fees or anything against him. I mean, it was one of those situations where it was early enough. There was nothing, nobody harmed. Kyle clearly wasn't perpetrating a fraud. Um, you know, it, it was just a, a missed opportunity all around. So, yeah, and that kind of put me in a situation where I just had to build and build and build past security. So, I mean, I built to the white paper over the next year and a half and, um, Throughout that time, John and I have had many, many conversations on how do we get to this utility status. And John would see great opportunities with Ethereum and Ethereum. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not <laughs> rolling up to a drag race in a Pinto. <laughs> but um, we're, we're still on it. And that's that's our path. It is, that is. 
Jonathan, I have a question for you. So it seems like that regulator knowledge, there's a gap between what's actually true of what's happening within blockchain and what actual reg regulators understand. So you're speaking about your experience with Kyle in 2018. How has the landscape changed now? I mean, do you feel like you're still creating bespoke solutions for your clients or is it still the wild, wild west or is there some sort of template that you follow now? It's not the wild, wild west. Um, you know, back in the day, my God, I mean, the amount of money being raised uh, and looking at the SEC fines now, respectfully, Kyle, maybe we should have went with it if they didn't catch you. Um, That's why I did it. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, <laughs> but, you know, in all seriousness, guys, uh, once again, this is not legal advice. I forgot to give that disclaimer. Philippe, your uh, disclaimer was all financial. This is not legal advice. This is my own opinions. This does not reflect uh, the opinions of uh, anyone else that I work with but me. Um, so, the landscape is better. Uh, we have three no action letters, which uh, to my colleagues credit have uh, come fighting tooth and nail with the SEC uh, to get those through. Most of them are Ethereum based uh, to Kyle's point. Um, but, you know, I was on the phone and I think it was October of last year uh, explaining to the SEC's San Francisco office, which is is the big boy office or big girl office that uh, handles all the technology, what Quorum was. Um, and so Quorum handles about a couple trillion dollars a day. Uh, it's JP Morgan's back end um, now. And there's, I think, two or 300 banks that use it around the world. The SEC should know that. Uh, they should be very, very familiar with what's going on there. Um, and they weren't. Uh, and that was last year. Um, so we've got a lot of education to do. I think the SEC is willing and um, kind of excited to hear about different things. Uh, but you have to realize that when we're talking about trillions of dollars, uh, you know, regardless of, of what we're doing, whether it's a digital currency or digital offering, uh, the numbers can get really high really fast. Um, and so that's what they're worried about is, uh, you know, Nana getting bamboozled. Um, and we've seen it. We've all seen it. We've all invested in something that turned out to be a scam. Uh, we've all had, you know, private keys that we've lost. Uh, anybody who's been in this thing long enough, uh, we realize that there's a lot of hurdles uh, that need to be overcome. And, you know, you know, to Cardano's, uh, you know, tip in the hat, they've really kind of taken that work and, and looked at it from an 80,000 foot view of, what are the problems? You know, how do we scale this? <laughs> how do we make this uh, a functional protocol for the masses? Um, and it's tough. It's really, really tough because you want to be able to shut down a fraud uh, as a digital security uh, as soon as you see it. Uh, and I see it on the capital market side all the time. I'll have uh, an, an issuer call me and ask me to release restricted shares uh, in a 144 opinion. And you're going, no, <laughs> these things haven't been locked up properly. This is, you know, all these different rules and mechanisms that, uh, you know, we're trying to make better and, and try to take the gatekeepers out. Uh, some of those gatekeepers need to be in there. Uh, and you guys, you know, as developers know that, uh, pardon the French, but if you put shit in, you get shit out. Um, <laughs> and so that's why, you know, it's really important to work with professionals that understand what is going on and what is going in. So you don't have to look back later and go, Ooh, that was a bad decision. <laughs> yeah. Those are good examples because there were ICOs that were initially done for Cardano, like uh, Traxia and it, it didn't look like a scam. It wasn't a scam, but it fell apart. And yeah. the law is there to protect consumers. Uh, like you said, to protect Nana from um, that type of major loss. I mean, most people in crypto know what kind of risk we are running, but the law still has to protect the, you get new people coming into it and say, oh, it's an investment. They want to invest in a 401k or whatever. Of course, not financial advice, or they want to invest in something. And they go, oh, well, this new cryptocurrency is a new way of doing it, which is how we sell cryptocurrencies to the general public. And the law has got to protect them. So... Yeah. Uh, can I take an observation there? I think decentralization uh, causes um, is something similar to insurance. This is, is in that uh, it's something you don't have control over. It's hard to put someone liable for something that's decentralized. So I think the legal models uh, uh, need to be closer to what we do in insurances, where we have pools, where someone 
where it's uh, the money is taken from a f joint funding when there's something bad happening. Because, for example, would a treasury be liable for something happening on the Corano network? Uh, I think there's some very interesting uh, things to discuss there, but maybe that's a bit advanced topic uh, to discuss right now. That it's a fascinating topic because, uh, you know, in the ICO <laughs> world, we're like, who do we sue now, right? Right, <laughs> because exactly. There have been, you know, uh, frauds. There have been, you know, actually people that have taken the money and ran. And then there's been, been failures, right? There's been people uh -huh. who have tried and maybe a million dollars isn't enough. Maybe $10 million isn't enough uh, when you're trying to, you know, recreate the internet or, you know, <laughs> God knows some of these other kind of things that were going on. Uh, that takes a lot of money, and yeah, they can be huge it, sums. Yeah, huge sums. Um, and you know, Telegram's a really good example of what can go wrong because even though they've raised what 1.6 billion dollars, like Telegram's great, but it's not you know that future vision of the internet that they were all claiming. And so, mm -hmm. when you take a look at that, do you go, well, was this a fraud or was there not enough money? And the battle they have with the SEC right now is incredibly interesting. Um, but it's going to be a long, hard fought one. Well, I think the you know the issue with I mean I, I totally understand the notion of protecting the retail investor, um, but what that mantra that the regulators have taken on is really really harming projects because not every project can viably compete under a security token model. It's just not going to work. So the bar to actually achieve true utility is it's insane for what you've got to build up front to get to that point to even kind of be in the clear um, yeah. before you can actually, you know, have real viable funding. And, you know, obviously, you know, we've been through a lot of that and I'm living that now. So I would love to see some sort of true guidance or legislation to come that would kind of enable um, us to push forward in that regard. But back to your point, John, yeah, the regulators, I just don't think they understand what's happening quite yet. Well, that's that's the whole reason middlemen exist and the whole reason we're trying to get away from it is because the barrier to entry is so high due to regulations and a whole bunch of other stuff. I mean, I have I worked at on the exchange side, so I've had to deal with the SEC and the CFTC as an exchange operator. And so we were commodities. We were doing Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, as well as traditional assets. And then we were like, okay, let's st start doing spot trading for you know, whatever cryptocurrencies we can. And then it's, all right, well, now we have to deal with each of the states directly. Yeah. And that's just a giant pain in the butt. And we were located yeah. in, in New York. And if we wanted anybody in New York to do stuff, it's NYDFS. And my God, that's a pain in the butt as well. And so, yeah, it's just a nightmare. But, you know, they, they are open to listening. Like they do appreciate education it's just that they're super slow and you have to explain things over and over and over <laughs> and over again <laughs> yeah i i mean it is the dmv guys like it is you know one of those things where you talk to the right person you know sometimes uh sometimes you have to go down the aisle and get, go to the next person to get whatever you've got to get done um but for the most part i mean there is a lot of progress going on uh and it does appear slow and it does appear to be frustrating. You know, we all thought at this point, at least most of the attorneys uh, that we have everything kind of figured out. Um, and we're not sure why um, everything's not figured out. Uh, but for the digital security side of things, you know, we, we know what a security is. We believe we know what a utility is. We've got some a little bit of beef with the SEC about everything needing to be uh, fully up and running, um, that none of the funds need to go to further development because Anybody who's ever ran a business knows that that's bullshit. Um, and I, I think that as we continue to progress through 2020, what we're going to see is we're going to see a lot more education pieces by the SEC. I know they recently released that IEO uh, IO, uh, IO thing. Um, and and mm. Way late. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, duh uh, is what I wrote about it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But – it's one of those situations where, hey, at least they're writing about it. You know what I mean? Um, sure. At least they're talking about it. At least they understand that this stuff is really important. Um, and, you know, moving forward, as we talk about fractionalization, as we talk about tokenization of assets, it's going to create Wall Street and the capital markets and DeFi and all of these other kind of derivative markets, so much more money and so much more freedom uh, if we do it the right way. And if we do it, you know, kind of in this, weird conglomeration of you guys developing, going to someone who understands this, like 
you know, God forbid, Silver Bank or one of those guys. But, you know, going to someone who actually gets this stuff and moving forward with it uh, at a rational and regulated level, uh, because banks are powerful for a reason. They've got a lot of legislation, legislative power behind them, and they can do some really cool stuff. And whether you like it or not, uh, you know, we're trying to build next level banks. We're trying to build decentralized finance. Uh, and that's freaking tough, man. It is. And Jonathan, that kind of – that touches on something that's important to me. People watching this podcast right now, what can they do to help move the ball down the field? Because the people watching the podcast are from all over planet Earth. Your specializing is basically in the United States. Um, so people need to be aware of that is this is not legal advice, as we mentioned already, and it's educational only. But – what can the average person do? Does writing their legislator help and say, hey, we, we, I support this blockchain project, and currently, like in the state of New York, the laws are relatively against blockchain. If the average person could just write their legislator, would that help uh, educate them in the interest? I'm so, I, I'm so glad you asked that, Rick. <laughs> um, I'm working with a guy out of South Carolina right now called Dennis. Uh, he's the founder of Palmetto Chain. Um, he has taken the most like proactive approach of drafting the legislation, uh, you know, talking with the legislator, um, dealing with senators and the, even the governor's office trying to push this stuff forward. He got a mention in uh, emerging technology in the state of the state address uh, by Henry McMaster. That is the pinnacle of a really devotion. I mean, he's even holding a conference, uh, the South Carolina Blockchain Conference in the end of Mar or mid March uh, that I'll be at. And that's kind of – that's the high end of what you can do. Uh, and now Dennis is fortunate enough that he's made good money and he's, he's really kind of developed out the ecosystem. For the average person who's just you know the hobbyist who believes in this stuff, who doesn't necessarily have the resources that Dennis has, it's a matter of, of combining your talents with the talents of others. So if you have an attorney that's local uh, – and we have attorneys all over the world uh, that we work with, contact me and I'll point you in the right direction. Um, but if, if you're dealing with, a, a like, like Kyle was a specific regulatory issue, we tried to work with the state as much as we could, uh, you know, granted we were already in front of the state, so it made it much easier. But if you think that you have something that is really important, uh, whether to state governance or to the, you know, entire ecosystem, uh, at large, try to find the decision maker, try to find the person who can say, yes, we're going to put, uh, you know, this DMV record on a blockchain because that makes it South, makes South Carolina easier to sell because South Carolina sells all your DMV data. Um, you know, it's one of those situations where as much as I love and hate DFS, like they are now trying to move themselves forward because they realize what a hindrance the bit license was, uh, you know, back in 2015, like, I mean, granted they were first movers, but it was in the wrong direction. Right. Um, and so it's one of those situations where if you're local and you see the problem and you believe that it makes sense to modify that ecosystem, then do it. If you believe that it's better to petition the SEC or the CFTC, because you have the Holy grail of what they're looking for, or you believe that they don't have a, a good understanding of Cardano or any other kind of uh, blockchain based protocol, then find someone who can get you in front of them. Um, it's much easier to do it through an intermediary like an attorney uh, because you don't say anything that may get yourself in trouble. Um, but if you haven't moved in that direction already, then there's nothing, like I said, they're the government. They work for you. Uh, you know, uh, both have, uh, they call them labs, CFTC lab and SEC uh, tech hub, FinTech hub. Um, so you can apply as a citizen uh, in the states and or, or, you know, you don't have to be a citizen, but as a person in the states, you can apply and, and go to talk to them and, and, you know, they'll hear you out and go through that whole process. It may take a while, uh, which is why we, you know, do suggest finding an intermediary. But um, that's the best way that I believe, um, you know, you can get involved from the governmental side, from a tech side. It's what you guys are doing right now. Like you're building things, you're breaking things, you're realizing this is working or this isn't working. Chris was talking about how you just created a bunch of nodes and forked a bunch of stuff or something as we were getting <laughs> on this. Like that's perfect. That's exactly what you need because you need to know where the pain points are. And it's better that you fight amongst the family right now before you go fight in public, right? Because right. 
we all have seen the headlines of Bitcoin was involved in child pornography and all this other stuff, but mm -hmm. it was Bitcoin that allowed them to trace the transactions. It wasn't Bitcoin's fault. Yeah. Like in the same way, it's not dollars fault when, you know, someone goes and uses it for yeah. illicit purposes. So. And nobody's that, talking about the charity projects and all the great things that's happening on the block. So many, yeah. There's so many great things. I think, I think that, you know, once we really kind of take a, and I hate to be all mainstream media, but it, once we have the, the uh, ability to put some of this stuff in front of the mainstream media and it does garner, you know, the affection of, oh, my God, these guys are, are, are really building something that's going to allow for, you know, more trees to be planted or more carbon dioxide to be pulled from the atmosphere because we're able to tax it properly. Like all of these different systems that are only going to exist because blockchain exists because people have been playing with it and going, hey, you know, this is really cool. We should figure out a way to use it. Very good answer, Jonathan. I have a we appreciate that. I'm long winded, so <laughs> feel free to jump in. And <laughs> I wanted to just quickly bre um, diverge this podcast now. So we've been recording for about half an hour. We have half this podcast left. So I wanted to open it up to the stake pool operators. So everyone here is a stake pool operator. Cardano is a proof of stake protocol, and we are all we are all constantly working on our nodes, trying to improve our nodes, working to provide the best possible services to our delegators. And I know that all these operators here probably have specific questions or more specific questions that would give them some more future guidance as to how they can, I don't know, create additional sources of revenue or create additional businesses within their stake pool. So... Everyone, the floor is open. Ask whatever stake pool operator question you'd like, and let's have a conversation. Yeah, and I think old Crypto Geek had one there. Were you going to go? Sure. I, uh, yeah, I have uh, two quick questions, actually. Um, number one, I'm not an American, so my, my question's, um, you know, how does uh, FinTrack play into things? Like, how, how does the SEC approach... Uh, um, token projects, ICOs that are coming from outside of the U.S.'s jurisdiction, number one. And number two, as a software developer that is creating um, wallet software, for example, um, how does the SEC approach um, that situation from an AML perspective? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so the SEC is taking the approach uh, offshore that as long as you're not perpetrating fraud, and you're not dealing with uh, U.S. investors where, you know, it could be a security that they don't care. Um, it's only when you start kind of soliciting U.S. investors or it's something where uh, I can't remember the name of it. I'm terrible with names. But there was a, a Russian uh, ICO that popped up recently that they tried to clamor down and, and rub out. But uh, the SEC is powerful. Um, it is not as powerful as the FBI or DOJ. Um, and so as long as it really doesn't involve too much fraud or too much uh, manipulation, especially of the capital markets, um, then it may be on their radar, but it's not going to be something that they're going to jump down the throat and then go try to extradite you or something like that. Uh, as far as wallets go, um, you know, the, the KYC AML component of a wallet under the Bank Secrecy Act is incredibly complex. Um, and so it really kind of matters what you're doing with that wallet what's going in that wallet, what's going out of that wallet. Um, but for the most part, uh, it's one of those situations where the SEC simply doesn't have jurisdiction um, unless it's a security. Um, if it's dealing with Bitcoin or Ethereum, uh, so the unofficial rule, and this is not legal guidance, blah, 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 don't do this. Um, but if it's listed on one of the American exchanges, it's outside of the SEC's purview. So as long as it's listed on there, because uh, they have really high-priced lawyers who fought the SEC on this stuff. Um, as long as it's listed on there, you're generally good. It's only when you start getting into newer things and, and kind of derivatives that kind of the CFTC pops its head up again and goes, hey, what are you guys doing? Um, but for the most like, part, the SEC, I don't want to say is a big soft kitten, but is a fairly big soft kitten as long as you're not perpetrating <laughs> fraud. So, so OCG, um, you know, if I were to look at that situation, I would – say relevant to cardano we'd probably want to watch till mainnet because you know if i had to predict that's when some of that stuff's going to turn for ada oh yeah i mean 
to say that eight is not on the uh, CFTC and SEC's radar is just stupid. Um, I think that, and I, I'm almost positive, positive I know the attorneys on this, but um, it's one of those situations where there's open lines of communication. They're aware of what's going on to the most part, you know, uh, and we're just going to kind of see what happens. Um, does that mean it's something like Kyle's case where things have been pre-negotiated? Maybe. Uh, is it something where they're like a telegram or, or a kick and it's like, come at me, bro? Um, maybe. Um, we'll see. Uh, that's a fun thing about the law is you can be right on the facts and right on the law and the government still wants to fight you for it. Uh, so, so we'll see. We might said, um, so what, what you said was like relating to wallets and so like, you know, you mentioned like an American exchange like Coinbase. So if a token's listed on Coinbase, you could write wallet software uh, for any of those uh, Coinbase tokens is what you were saying, right? And now, that, that is the unofficial advice that I am providing. Right, this right, audience. right. <laughs> um, so what happens, does that apply to like any token that's uh, traded through that, like, you know, like Ethereum, uh, any of those tokens that are traded in there, does that apply to those as well or do they have different rules? Well, that's where the CFTC starts going, hey, is that a derivative? Because we want to govern derivatives, right? I don't know if you guys know this, but this cryptocurrency stuff is probably going to be around for a while. <laughs> and uh, the CFTC is like, oh, my God, we have an opportunity to be bigger than the SEC, right? Because, like I said, anything that is a derivative of Bitcoin, right, that's the OG there, is technically within their purview. So there's like, I think, 1,500 coins at this point listed so on coin market cap. So they care about crypto those. kitties. Right. They even care about crypto kitties because technically it's not movie tickets or whatever onions that are not within the uh, commodities and exchange act. So they want to expand their money, man. They want to expand their power and their influence. So you're, you're saying that they're looking at every coin on coin market cap as a derivative of Bitcoin. Yeah. Well, isn't it that oh, wow. it, it's whether or not it's a commodity or a security and if it's a commodity the cfpc governs it if it's a security the sec it is but that's where the literally the the uh scc and the cftc are fighting each other yeah. but that's that's technically inaccurate oh i mean it's technically inaccurate absolutely but you can be that's the weird thing about this stuff guys is you can in theory be both right like I, ethereum let's take the classic example that was an ICO. I don't know if you guys remember that, but that was an ICO, right? And now the CFTC says, uh, well, it's so decentralized, you know, it acts as a commodity because all these people are building on top of it. So now you have both jurisdictions or both uh, regulatory agencies up your butt. And then once Ethereum launches 2.0 and it's proof of stake, they might have to reevaluate it all over again. Oh, yes. absolutely. I mean, proof of stake, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> going to want to buy to the Apple, right? I mean, Treasury is going to look at this stuff, and the U.S. Treasury is going to look at this stuff and go, wait a second, you guys are banking now. But guess what? You're in my ball or my court. Come on, bring the ball. Mm. So leading, that leads into another question then as node operators generating coins and, uh, you know, what are the tax implications? What are the, what are the, uh, the, I'm not a tax attorney, so I have some really good tax people if you want to speak to them. But, well, I mean, um, there's legal implications as well as tax implications, obviously. Absolutely. The, the taxes on this stuff, guys, are absolutely ridiculous. Uh, there's a, been a new bill introduced that uh, the Virtual Currency Act of 2020 or something that uh, goes up to $200 in personal uh, transactions, but it's not enough. You know, I'd like to see a thousand, two thousand dollar limit. Um, for every transaction, uh, I think that's when you start getting, you know, to, the really kind of shady deals after that. <laughs> to, to, to my understanding as a pool operator, um, we're going to be taxed as income the moment the protocol pays us as pool operators, whatever the U.S. dollar value is of that. Uh, other than year, um, it's capital gains tax after the fact. Uh, that's my understanding. I'm not a tax attorney either, so if anybody <laughs> has any other uh, insight there. Um, but just on, on to that, um, 
relevant to pool operators, is there any way that this activity could be deemed a security? We kind of had a conversation about given how the proof of stake protocol handles everything. Delegators can delegate to a pool without a pool's permission. They can remove delegation to a pool without a pool's permission. There's no custodial activity going on on behalf of the pool or uh, by the pool operators on behalf of the delegators. Um, can you maybe provide any insight how that's going to maybe affect the ecosystem? And obviously this is all just your you know, <laughs> opinion. Yeah, uh, no pressure. Um, I mean, I wish I had a crystal ball, um, but I believe that the SEC and the CFTC are going to try to say, okay, how – how is this operating? Does this count as an investment in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit to the effects or, or uh, uh, efforts of a third party or promoter? Wouldn't delegation be more like uh, giving somebody a proxy vote or something? Like, you know, you have That's a bunch right. Of- it, it would be, but your, your proxy votes are people who have that right to vote. And so just by owning ADA or owning whatever, uh, does that give you the right to vote? Is that right to vote a a company wide policy or is it a delegation node policy? Right. And so then you start running into. Well, you all haven't. The... Go ahead. I was just going to say the delegators have an opportunity to choose their pool, and I and yeah. I'm not an attorney either, but a delegator has absolutely absolutely zero chance of losing data and delegating to a pool. So it's not really an investment. You're just maybe mitigating your upside. Well, so here's the thing. If I put in my ADA to your pool, am I able to put that ADA anywhere else? Yes. Yes, you can spend it. But after a lockup period. But after, yeah, after there's the lockup period, right? And so... No, the ADA ADA can always be moved. But it doesn't take uh, an epoch before you can change that's, it. Right? That's just moving between rewards. pools. Yeah, that's moving between pools. But you can spend your ADA, boom, just like that. If you've got it delegated to a pool, I can spend it all and buy a car. Nobody's oh, yeah, involved. Yeah, yeah. The, tra- hmm. the transaction settles just as so, fast. So then it becomes this question of whether that was an investment, right? Yep. And that's the answer we don't know. Because if I'm able to put my ADA in your pool – and vote on whatever I want, right? Whatever, you know, proxy vote you have. And then spend it. How how does that look from a CFTC point of view? How does that look from an SEC point of view? I bet the so just just to clarify, can I, can I clarify a technical matter for a moment, please? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Currently, by delegating to a pool, the only vote you really have is whether or not you get returns based on that pool's percent. Yeah. But once voting comes out, it will be a totally separate function. So delegation based on money and voting will be two totally separate paths unrelated. You delegate to one pool and your vote can be given to a different technical expert completely irrelevant. So just just to clarify that. And, and yeah. also to add on to that, uh, a coin has delegation power as well as spending power. And yeah. they're completely separate. Yeah, well, but... Like I said, that's where you start balancing the line of is this a commodity and a security at the same time, right? Because I have voting power, <laughs> but then I also have spending power. And right. And the delegation has value as well. Uh, yeah. And, and the delegation power has power as well. You know, the, the, the node operator, the pool operator has this like weird treasury function of, of mining. Like, and then it becomes like, like I said, the treasury is going to really get interested in once it understands what staking is because they're going, wait a second, you're generating currency. Uh, because if you want to treat it as, you know, okay, we're outside of the SEC and the CFTC by saying this is a, an actual currency, this is a monetary value, then you fall within the area of treasury and, and all of their banking mm-hmm. laws. Uh, and I'm not sure that's a path I'd want to go down it uh, seems more of a commodity to me. Yeah, well, and the CFTC is always going to argue it's a commodity. But once it goes down the commodity realm, then you've got – and there's been new uh, proposed rules for this uh, out of the CFTC last last week or the week before uh, of what a commodity registration looks like. And so that's really exciting but also kind of terrifying because, once again, CFTC, they're not really sure what they're doing over there, <laughs> respectfully, uh, my CFTC friends, if you're listening. Um so it, it, it's this doubt, it's this uh, balancing of 
oh my God, are we everything? Or, oh my God, are we nothing? And therefore we need a new classification. Um, I don't know. Is, is there some Jonathan, resource? that's a really good point. And I would like to uh, go over to a Reddit question that follows well with what you just said. And I, I would also like to note, we, we got about 20 minutes left, so we're good there as well. And we'll get to your question in a second there, James. Um, the Reddit question is from Cryptoactive. And they state that the Canada Revenue Agency and most likely other national revenue agencies ask for details about large foreign assets owned by their citizens. Since the Cardano blockchain is global, how would you answer this question? Where do our ADA live? <laughs> so, oh. again, this is for educational purposes only. <laughs> yeah. and this is a Canadian person asking an American person, right? Yeah. But where do the ADA live? On the interwebs. No, um, so that's a great question. Um, for an American, we're going to use an American example, uh, switch it up a little. You have to declare all your assets. Uh, I can't remember the tax act. Um it came out recently. That's where all the rich people were starting to give up their passports and stuff. I presume uh, that if I was a Canadian, I'd want to disclose this. Um, I know that hurts a lot of people that are going to hear it, but I would rather not fight the IRS or the Canadian IRS when it came to anything like that. Um, that's what took down Al Capone. Uh, that's what you know took down Wesley Snipes. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's one of those situations where. If there's taxes, guys, and it's a business, I'm sure you guys can go buy a new laptop or a new uh, microphone or mining equipment, whatever you want to do to offset your taxes. Talk to a CPA, financial advisor, someone to you know really kind of mitigate those circumstances. Um, but jurisdictionally, I have no idea what it is in Canada if you can have assets offshore. Uh, and don't and not have to disclose them to, to the Canadian government. Um, but I know in the States, you better do that or just committed a felony. Uh, wow. And a good follow up to that question would be, when would you want to disclose it? Like each tax year, just an example, we know it's not legal or financial or tax advice, like each tax year or I mean, some countries say you have to account day by day. Um, just yeah, I, whatever your it, local law is, right? Whatever your local law is. I mean, there's a lot of really good platforms now that are trying to handle taxes because taxes uh, are really stupid um, uh, in crypto because they, once again, the IRS doesn't understand them, right? So if I have this ball in order for, uh, you know, 10 Bitcoin, well, it may get filled at different levels, right? Unless I set a limit. Um and then guess what? I have to pay, you know, different transaction fees on that. Like there's all of these different uh, kind of taxable events that happen within one transaction uh, or that can happen within one transaction. And so even just with a lim limit order, you might have partial fills. Yeah, exactly. Even with a limit order, you might have partial fills. Right. Um, and so it, it's one of those situations where you've got to really speak to the professionals uh, in your jurisdiction uh, involving taxes because. Don't mess with the tax man. You think the SEC didn't play? The tax man don't play. <laughs> now that's good advice. <laughs> I'll go over to Reddit or more, more questions. I've James has a question. Has a question. Well, oh, I, James and Chris? Yeah. 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 Go ahead, James. Is there like any kind of resource? I mean, it seems like there's like a lot of laws and agencies that need to be changed. And, you know, right now we have an administration that wants to reduce regulations. This might actually be a good time, maybe, to simplify things. Is there any kind of resource for what we should be pushing for? Oh, that, that's a arguably trillion dollar question there, James. Mm -hmm. um, the SEC is not going to change anything. The CFTC may. Uh, the IRS, I don't know if you know who runs Treasury, um, they, don't, they don't like Bitcoin. Uh, they don't like anything blockchain. They have to do um, what the lawmakers tell them, though. So, like, if we push things on the, you know, talking to the lawmakers, get, getting getting our senators in front of the president or something like that. There's a lot of really powerful guys in front of Trump uh, that deal with cryptocurrency. Um, Trump don't care. <laughs> Trump don't care. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying that that's an appropriate route. I'm not saying that's going to work. 
I know that uh, the lack of enforcement, uh, the lack of um, aggressive enforcement, I guess we would say, uh, under this administration has been because people have been bending his ear. Um, Can we get like a law change? You know, anything, like any kind of resource that we know that, you know, we push in this direction, it'll have a positive effect. Yeah, because I wish I could point to a specific one. Like, I really wish I could, you know, hammer out what is a utility that's outside of a commodity for the CFTC. But there's no way. You know what I mean? Like that that pushing that through would literally be an act of Congress, right? Um, yeah. I mean, and I'm not saying that's what needs to happen. Uh, but given the political climate, it's an election year. I don't think anything major is going to happen unless it's on kind of the Republicans agenda, quite frankly. Yeah, um, I, think, I think it's going to come from a global, global project or projects that are just too, too big and too disruptive that we're going to have to look at it as a, from the U S perspective to maintain economic relevance. That's just exactly, my opinion. Exactly. I mean, look, with all due respect to, you know, Caitlin and, and all the folks up in uh, Bob up in uh, Wyoming, like, Wyoming's trying to be the new Delaware, but like, guys, how many of you have incorporated in Wyoming? No, <laughs> not, not me. None. No. See, so just like Bitcoin, no. <laughs> like I, I just created a, I just incorporated in Wyoming the other day, Damn but it, it has Philly. nothing to do with blockchain. Yeah. Yeah. IOHK well, did so, though, right? So to <laughs> follow- IOHK did. There's a couple others that did. Uh, my friend Anessa's doing the first DSO out of there. Like, I think they're doing great work, but it's one of those situations where, unless people use it, like you know, the stuff that Dennis is doing in front of the legislation uh, legislative bodies in South Carolina is really great because he's got plans to use it. Right? He's got okay. Now that that's passed, guess what I can do? Right? And you know, to James's point. If you really want to get something done within your local jurisdiction, now's the time to try to do it. Like start now because it may take longer than you think. Um, but you know, globally or nationally, it's going to be something where America's interests aren't you know being aligned. You saw how quickly everybody started giving a damn after Libra popped up. Um, you started realizing that, hey, uh, you know, maybe we need to look into some type of global currency. Um, it's one of those situations where it's the outside influences that really kind of determine political movement. And you've got to really kind of find the sweet spot. If you're Kyle, uh, you know, like I said, the North Carolina didn't give a damn about us. Um, mm-hmm. South Carolina is trying to give a damn, but that's because they've got somebody who's really pushing hard. New York is slowly starting to give a damn. You know, we're working with DFS to try to make thir- make sure that, you know, they don't go down the wrong path again and, and, <laughs> and wipe out the, the city of New York from blockchain um, and, and Buffalo, uh, respectfully. But, um, you know, those kind of initiatives are really self-led. They're, they're not something where, uh, you know, the government's going to call you and be like, hey, guys, have you heard of Bitcoin? What's this stuff? Doesn't happen. You got you to be really proactive. To James's is, point, is there any magic words that uh, pe- people that are watching this podcast and here on the podcast, is there any magic words they should be using with their legislators? You know, the legislators that we elect, they, they, they go to town halls, they have town hall meetings. And if someone goes to a town hall meeting or write or they're writing a letter or they're interacting, what's the magic words? Is there any that you know of? What do they want to hear? Hey, this is interesting they, to me. They want to hear specifics. They want to hear what you're doing. They want to hear, uh, you know, why are you, their time is valuable. They have a bunch of constituents, constituents. Um, you got to be specific. You've got to be direct. This is what we want to do. This is what we want to talk to you about. Have a plan, have a protocol, have something you want to accomplish. Uh, if you don't, you end up kind of just sitting there. It's wasting going, their time and falling on deaf ears. Well, I, I like maintaining relevance. Yeah, or, or or worse, like I said, you get something done and nobody cares. Nobody nobody's rallying behind you, going, "Oh my God, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread," um, because it's not necessary. It's not needed. It's not. It's not. What is the? It's not an invention. It's a innovation of something that doesn't. Users. Matter. Yeah, I mean, need users. You got to have actual participation, and preferably a group. Like, no offense to anyone here or anyone 
that's listening, but if it's a one man band, it, it's really tough to get stuff done or that's one woman band. Like it is very tough. So if you've got a group of people within your local jurisdiction or, you know, within an international jurisdiction who really want to push something against, you know, the EU body or, uh, you know, the American body or South African nations or, or the, uh, the Europe, uh, MENA, the region, um, or the South Africans and the, uh, the uh, Nigerian kind of alliance, like all of those guys are really working hard because they understand what this stuff can bring and what kind of, uh, you know, problems it can solve. And that's why, you know, you see this kind of really rapid movement. So, like I said, it, it is a movement. You've got to get enough people behind you to really make it move. Wow, excellent. All right, we're coming up. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left here, and I wanted to touch on another Reddit question. This was from one of our, our popular pool operator attendees, Old Pasink. And Old Pasink asked, um, with the SEC scrutinizing cryptocurrencies so closely, do you think it's wise for pool operators to use terms like yield, return on investment, and gains? especially since the SEC has not ruled on the status of many cryptocurrencies, including Cardano, and that most pool operators are not financial advisors. So yields, returns, gains, uh, are, are some of these words going to get us in trouble? I think so. Um, and I've <laughs> always advised that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've written utility token opinions and we remove all that kind of shit. Uh, Pardon the French, but I get to cuss because if I, you misinterpret me, we both go to jail kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's one of those situations where ROIs, investments, uh, gains, maybe, you know, try to rewards. be creative. Yeah. Be, rewards. Be, rewards, um, you know. And here's a, here's a way with the investment terms. <laughs> yeah. Here's a very specific example that people have asked me. Now, this is for education only, not legal. But education. I've had people say, hey, if I stick with your pool, are you going to give me a reduced rate? Is there a longevity return? <clears throat> and my initial thought was, wow, that's a good idea. But that only works on the playground in elementary school. <laughs> in the real world, there's a lot of legal implications to doing something like that. Uh, I don't there know. Are. What, a rewards uh, program. Yeah. I, I These mean, pool operators are not uh, Samsung and Apple. These pool operators are average Joe, Bob, Billy, Bob, right? Yeah. They, they don't have corporate lawyers. No. Um, and quite frankly, nor should you at this point. Like, it's not something where I, I think you need it. Um, I think you need to be aware of it. I think you need to be aware of the ecosystem as a whole because – first person they're going to go after are the bigger guys, right? Uh, within the pools. Um, that being said, um, I, I think you stay away from these terms. I think you, you know, do reward, uh, loyalty. Um, I think that's something that is permissible with, uh, any kind of SAS model, any type of, uh, utility model. Um, I think that you can balance a line between even a commodity on that. So you can say that, you know, look, this is, got value, but it's only kind of intrinsic value within this system. Um, now, secondary exchanging and all that other kind of stuff does muddle those waters a little bit. But for the most part, like I said, guys, we don't know. Um, and we won't know until I'm assuming 2025 when more of the stuff gets handled, uh, hammered out to the point where I can comfortably say what this is and what this isn't. Um, but DeFi solutions for the most part, uh, scare the hell out of all the regulators. Um, you know, it just, it is what it is. Well, hey, no. John, can I, I'm sorry. I just want to ask a real quick question on this to follow up. Uh, would you think it's acceptable to use the term ROI in the scope of um, looking backwards? Pool A <laughs> produced this ROI, this epoch, and it's a mathematical fact. Would that be acceptable? You know, what does the I stand for? Yeah, I mean, mm. uh, one of the, the biggest uh, reasons that finance is so tough is they like inventing their own terms. ROS. Uh, I really encourage you guys to invent your own terms. Okay. Um, I think it'll make life a lot easier in the long run. All right, Define let's use, our own terms. Let's use ROS, return on staking. 
don't use anything that uh, the capital markets use. If you Google it and it's on Investopedia, change it. <laughs> <laughs> so we can't just come up with a different definition for ROI. <laughs> it's got to actually. I, yeah, I, I wouldn't go yeah. down. That. <laughs> I wouldn't go down that. This isn't just... murder. This is you know hugging someone until they don't breathe anymore. Uh, yeah, I, I... <laughs> you know, at least we have Papa Carp. We can say, hey, can you can you hook us up on Pool Tool and change a little bit of those acronyms around? <laughs> Yeah, I mean... That way everybody knows what they're looking at. I, like I said, this isn't legal advice. This is not something that, you know, you should bank on, uh, pun intended. But um, I would definitely not use investment-related terms, especially in the capital markets, or anything related to commodities or anything like that. I know that's not something that uh, has an Investopedia kind of definition, but it's... it's, it's fantastic a advice. Yeah, thank you. We're just asking to get the microscope on us by <laughs> using where hey investment you know invest in my pool oh invest okay yeah let's I go mean, take a look at that guy right, right? I, I mean yeah and you're right they will they'll go after the biggest ones first because it's like okay let's see what happens let's let, you know let's hit that guy and find out what happens on the big one they won't go after the little ones one percent so they will eventually if they one percent <laughs> well, yeah. so, like, i might i might ask people to stake with me i mean i'm just stake uh, is fine yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, return uh, on staking. That's what we'll do. That's what I'm going to do. I, and, I like that. And um, you know, I'm, it's not like I'm giving them the coins. They're giving themselves the coins. They're self-generating. So, yeah, yeah, a better, a different term would be a good thing to do. Because if I invest in a company, then the money is coming back, you know, via stocks or whatever it is. The money's coming back from them through some vehicle. But when it comes to staking, it's not. It's just the Ouroboros God is magically making it appear. Well, maybe, yeah. And I don't yeah, give it to anyone. Funny. It just appears out of nowhere. How does this, because this is very similar to uh, mining in a pool, right? Um, it, it, classic Bitcoin mining or, or Ethereum mining, mining as a pool, right? Yeah. Like, so how do they treat that uh, situation? Uh, it depends on what kind, what, what you're mining, right? Um, if it's Bitcoin, then... Uh, it technically falls under this weird digital currency. You have to be taxed as this property stuff. Um, if it's within this like mining as a utility, then it falls under this weird, uh, it has to be like pocket full of quarters, for example, is one of the no action letters. They're only allowed to present uh, this number of quarters uh, available for uh, buying and selling. Like it's not uh, a burnable rate or anything like that. So mining is one of those examples of it depends on how it's used if it's used as a security right like if you give me uh let's say we have a reverse split right you give me your shares and then i you know reverse split them into new shares um that's still a security that still falls within you know the exchange and uh securities and exchange act so it's one of those situations where just because you call it mining you've got to look deeper into what it actually is does that make sense? Yes. I mean, mining to me is almost, you know, it's like you said, SaaS almost, right? Um, you're you're doing physical work, computational work to to support the network security. So, I mean, I understand this is very gray, obviously. Yeah. I mean, I mean mining is one of those situations where you know, let's say let's say if you had something where. Uh, you know, you guys are actively participating in a SaaS program, uh, and it's an equity stock derivative. Uh, so every, the more you start uh, being involved with the program, the more it starts paying you out um, computational equity. Guess what that is? It's a security. Hands down. My wife's not too thrilled with me, but I have um, a bunch of uh, ant miners running instead of running natural gas. Well, she's not thrilled about the noise, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm actually heating my house with it right now because it's cold. Oh, here. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. And, wow. and you know, I, I got the miners real cheap because they were only barely breaking even, but hey, it's cheaper than natural gas. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe reusing the heat. Yeah, of course, of course, I might end up getting bit somehow with all these weird laws. And <laughs> well, I mean, it's one of those situations where, you know, you may have to uh, talk to someone about that, um, preferably a financial advisor. But it's, uh, 
not something that was is not how do I say this? It's not something that's so unfeasible that we couldn't figure it out, right? Because taxes are, are really clear right now. Um, it's only when we start dealing with commodities and exchanges and uh, securities that are all wrapped in one where we go, well, we don't want to tax you seven times or we don't want to you know, deal with this kind of regulation versus this regulation and is this unregistered. That's where things get really crazy. Uh, so mining in and of itself is is fairly carved out um, taxes, commodities, and securities wise. We just have to take a deeper look. Thanks, Jonathan, for your great insight. Um, I think Chris has a question. Let's get to Chris's question. We're wrapping it up. We have a few minutes left. So Chris, do you have a question for Jonathan? I do. Uh, Jonathan, uh, I've been exploring uh, the possibilities for incentives um, for uh, delegators. Uh, it, you, you've talked a lot about um, the potential pitfalls of that, but if I offer cash incentives, so not cryptocurrency, um, would that still fall under a security? I don't know. My biggest fear for you would be of whether, what do those incentives look like? Are they paid out? Are they paid out? um, How do I say this? Proportionally per work. Uh, So, Kyle and I are doing the same work. Do we get the amount of the same amount of money or does someone hit a block and, and then get a bunch of money? It's a good question. Uh, I, you know, my initial thought was uh, like for every million, you know, just, just say you have to have a million ADA to stake uh, to qualify for incentives. And then you get, you know, $20 a day for every day that you do that or something like that. So in the difference is mm. I'm paying them a one-time fee, I mean, per and day. And it's not explicitly tied to rewards. Exactly. Yeah. So per- performance is, it's, it's irrelevant. Performance is irrelevant. I think you're clear. Okay. Um, but then when you start, here's, here's a, Want to go down a terrifying road? Yeah. Um, if if you're dealing with a a utility, right, uh, a okay. Chuck E. Cheese token or whatever, yeah, uh, you can give them out all willy nilly. You can uh, have uh, different lotteries and raffles and fun things like that. Yeah, it's only when you start dealing with value uh, do you start getting into this whole world of are you gambling now? Uh, and if you're gambling. What are you gambling on? And what are the odds? Because if you don't report the odds, mm-hmm. FBI is going to be at your ass. Uh, and you yeah. don't want that. It's not really gambling, though. It's it's, it's almost like, uh, again, proxy voting. Vote for me. I'll give you 20 bucks. Maybe. Uh, it depends yeah. on how Vote it's used. Yeah. Uh-huh. And to be honest, I'm not sure that I'm confident in uh, being able to predict what the government will say to move forward with this. I'm, I'm uh, not either. That's why we generally kind of ask them first or, or right. send a couple of letters and mm-hmm. make sure we have everything hammered out. When you guys yeah. see a no action letter, uh, that's generally a couple months worth of work behind it. Oh, I see. Um, and I know for a fact that, and when we deal with this in, in the capital markets, that you can't just give away uh, stock. Um, that's one of the things they're starting to kind of figure out ways around it and different ways to do it with some consideration. There has to be some consideration um, or starts falling into what we call shell company rules. Um, and so, uh, you know, airdrops and, uh, you know, decentralized kind of finance like this where, okay, you know, now that you've staked, you can start earning equity in the company or equity in the pool or all these other kind of incentives. And you're going, Mm, now we're crossing three lanes of traffic at once. Let me see right. which one we need to take first right, um, yeah. and make sure that we're clear at those, you know, different levels, because like I said, you, you know, you could be causing three different taxable events. You could be dealing with three different regulatory agencies. You could sure. be violating all types of weird and silly laws. You know, the biggest problem, quite frankly, I find with staking, um, pardon me, everyone, but is you don't really know, like Kyle, to Kyle's point, who's staking in your pool, right? And so assuming that you've got some whale 
I don't know, putting enough money in your pool to make you go, damn, we are now officially balling. Um, and then you find out that this person's uh, North Korean or mm-hmm. uh, if you're in you know, the States, Iranian. Um, what do you do? What, what can't do anything? <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's the do. thing. It's now you're facilitating um, uh, what is essentially money laundering, um, and, well, and you can't do anything. Yeah. Similarly, if you have a pool that has 100% fee, now somebody could stake to you and you could make money from somebody else that you have to pay taxes on, and you have no control over that. that that's an excellent point, yeah. That was my initial point uh, about decentralization. We don't have control over these things. And the closest model we have in legal is uh, insurance because natural disasters, we don't have control over them. And you need some form of uh, liability that doesn't go against uh, the person in the pool. uh, Hmm. I was going to say, let's all make a billion dollars and we'll chip in for a yacht if it goes sideways. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, that's, that's not a bad idea. Um, I mean, guys, like, uh, I, I think it's the long-term stock exchange, right? Um, you get more voting power as you start, as you hold um, the stock and the theory that, you know, you kind of nix the short sellers and nix the people who are trying to make market moves against you. Um, I think that has legs in the capital market. I think staking has legs. I think that, you know, as a what industry, you know, banking 3.0, if I decide to stake, uh, Kyle, I'm going to use you again, in Kyle's pool because I have a better ROS <laughs> um, than, you know, Felipe's or, or James's, then those kind of banking solutions are something that we find valuable in the capital markets. Um, and so we should, you know, be aware of what's going on with this technology, uh, you know, be comfortable in using it. You know, we're part of open law and Lex Dow and all these other things now that are really kind of the lawyers figuring out what this stuff looks like. And that's really exciting because we really hate the transactional part of our job. Uh, it's been around for too long and we're trying to make it easier for everyone. Um, and so, you know, we find the value in this technology as well. And we're hoping that eventually, like I said, I think 2025, we're going to have everything really kind of hammered out and we'll be able to give honest answers uh, and, and, and really conclusive answers about what things are and what they're not. Um, but for the most part, you know, we're dancing this really weird line of, okay, we think it's this, uh, and we're comfortable and, you know, from a legal point of view to hang our hat and say that it is this. Uh, but if it's not, you know, we're also comfortable in fighting it, that it is this because we have no idea what else it could be. Um, and that's, you know, kind of what we did with Kyle. And that's why, you know, when we had that opportunity to take advantage of the law they already writ- wrote, uh, then it really breaks my heart that they didn't. Um, and I think, you know, Kyle feels the same way. And that's how, uh, you know, to James's point that when you go talk to these folks, you got to make sure that you've got a use case. You've got to make sure that they've got an understanding of what you're doing so they feel comfortable in hanging their hat on it. That's a great pl- That's a great point to wrap up this podcast. That's well said, Jonathan. Philippe? Yes, yes. Eistein, did you have a last-minute question, or are we going to wrap this up? Um, I think we have had a great discussion, so, uh, yeah. Okay. Let's roll into the wrap. Sounds good. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Jonathan. We really appreciate it. We've done this for 70. This is our 74th episode when we release it. And uh, we, this is the first time we've had a guest speak on these, this type of issue. So I think it's going to be very refreshing for other stake pool operators and delegators. I think you shared a lot of gems. Um, I'm not sure if they're 100% positive, 100% negative. I mean, it's, <laughs> Slightly scary, slightly like, oh, I don't know what's going to happen, but I think everyone appreciates your perspective. I really do. Um, so I want to thank Eistein, Kyle, and Kyle Lowe as well, James, OCG, Chris for joining us as well. And hopefully we can have you on the podcast again and we can touch some different topics. But we, we appreciated the time you spent with us today. And to all the viewers out there, thank you for tuning in. And remember to like and subscribe and continue supporting the Cardano Effect podcast. We're going to continue bringing high quality guests like Jonathan. And I hope everyone has a great week and enjoy the next episode. Enjoy this episode and the next episode of the Cardano Effect podcast. 
See you later, everyone. Until next time. Thanks, Thank guys. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.